Good afternoon, everybody who's joining us. Thanks very much for tuning in. My name is Kevin Addix with the Maryland Wineries Association, and we are live with a couple of folks who I'll introduce in just a moment. We're tasting through some dry reds today as part of our Stay Home and Wind Down series, where uh, if you were lucky enough to be one of the, the folks who ordered one of the wine packs, you have four of the six wines that we're trying today. It could be any four of the uh, of the six wines. We switched it up a little bit. That was the the uh, joy and benefit of, of the mystery packs is we got to be in charge of the mystery component. Uh, we have with us today a great uh, co-speaker, moderator, presenter here, and that is Dr. Joe Fiola from the University of Maryland. He is the viticulturist and small fruit specialist. Joe, welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Appreciate you including me on this. I'm really excited about the opportunity today. Joe, quick, tell us what you do at the University of Maryland. And, and aside from teaching and researching, you're actually in the vines and in the tanks. Uh, yeah, my um, major portion of my responsibility is to work with the commercial growers in the state. So I'm constantly helping them, doing site visits, uh, site evaluations, getting the nutrient management programs. Uh, answering questions with any problems, troubleshooting things in the vineyard, whatever it happens to be. And the second component is I do research and development. I, uh, the majority of that is growing different varieties, great varieties around the state, the different diverse regions we have and seeing how they respond and uh, trying to be able to recommend to growers which are the best cultivars and varieties that do best for them to make the, the grow the best in the vineyard and make the best wine in their winery. So I'm blessed with the best yeah, the best job in the world, next to yours, of course, Kevin. No, I think you got the best job in the world. Um, so we, we've had some some questions over the years about, you know, this is this is Joe Fioli. He's our grape guy. He's grape guy. He's doing a lot of cool things in the vineyard. What's he doing making wine? Well, my my answer to that briefly is, wine is my data. I'm a scientist, of course, and it's all about data and information. Uh, and, you know, with, you know, I'm also, also, as you said, a small fruit specialist um, or as a more politically correct, a size challenge berry specialist uh, these days. Um, but I also uh, do raspberry and strawberry work. And with those, the variety is very important because of the flavors you drink, that you taste the fruit directly and the cultivars are very important there. With wine, it's different. Um, you're growing the grapes, but the you don't taste the grapes to evaluate them. You taste the wine and that's what people are used to. So when being able to taste the grapes, you can say, yeah, they do well in the vineyard. Grapes taste good, but really that doesn't give you the best inclination of what's going to happen when it makes into wine. So when I grow the cultivars, I say how they do viticulturally, but I also make the wine and say, this is the ultimate data that, you know, this variety in this region, this is the wine you taste. And that's ultimately the product that we're working with because it's a value added product with grapes. So I try to cover that as much as possible. And, and a couple of times a year, Joe, you offer experimental wine tastings, um, not, not experimental tastings, but tastings of experimental wines for winemakers and, and anyone else who's interested to try some of the varieties that may not be more generally produced or available. And you've come up with some very cool varieties over the years that are turning out to be great in Maryland. Yeah, and that's the idea to say, you know, we like the traditional varieties, we know which do well, but we're always looking for great for varieties that are more sustainable, grow better, survive our winters better, you know, can use less uh, fungicides, you know, more disease resistance, and of course, you know, make wines. And there's, you know, a lot of wineries who want to do specific types of uh, products in uh, different, different regions of the world and represent. So we try to do as merse, uh, you know, as diverse a variety of varieties that we can try from around the world so we can have the, the different pockets from different regions that people can uh, associate with. So, Joe, with that, I'm going to bring in our panel, and then we're going to get get tasting. But first, I want to have uh, have folks introduce themselves. Let me pull them up in no particular order. So, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, first, let's jump to Neil Basford from Elk Run. Neil. Hi. It's a pleasure to be here, Kevin. Uh, Fred Wilson and I founded Elk Run about... 40 years ago, and we've been growing grapes, mostly the traditional varieties uh, since then. And uh, Fred and I uh, are both aficionados of red wine, so we grow too many red varieties. The one we're going to be tasting today is Cabernet Franc, and we were one of the first, actually the second, grower of Cabernet Franc. 
in Maryland. And and it is true. You've you've grown some some amazing grapes over the years, and uh, everything from Cab Franc, which we're tasting today, to uh, there's even been Pinot, and uh, there, at least one year there was a Zinfandel in a bottle. We grew Zinfandel for about uh, six years or seven years, uh, and we only got a crop on it about every third year because it's very sensitive to moisture when the grapes are ripening. And it'll turn to and it would turn to slime. So only in perfect years would we get any zin. We made some nice ones, but uh, we pulled out the two test rows we had about eight years ago now. We're also a grower of Gewürztraminer. Uh, I like it because I have six German, which I took in high school and college, and I can say the word. Uh, but that makes a lovely uh, a lovely wine, and it's pretty hardy and grows pretty well in this area. And and you grow that in a in a slightly off dry, uh, or produce it in a slightly off dry style, and that it, that wine just sings in the glass. Yeah, we like it at about one percent residual sugar. That's enough to make it feel soft in the mouth, but not sweet. Well, we look forward to trying the Cab Franc, and thanks very much for joining us. Uh, Thank you. Next up, let's jump to Tom Shelton, who's joining us from vacation. So, Tom, thanks for <laughs> thanks for joining us. I wouldn't call it a vacation, but it's certainly a break from the farm. Um, my name's Tom Shelt, and I'm the owner and winemaker for Bordello, which is located just south of Salisbury, uh, Maryland, on the eastern shore. Uh, we grow 12 varieties, uh, most of vinifera. Someone asked me why I had 12 varieties, and I said I didn't know any better, and that's true. It would be much easier to make less wines. We make over 22 different wines. But we make seven reds, one of which is our Malbec. Uh, Joe Fiola did uh, encourage me to plant Malbec back in 2007. We planted uh, an acre. I really have been extremely pleased with it. Uh, the only hitch in that was in 2014, we had extreme cold weather and we lost about half of the vine. So we've had to rebuild. Uh, we now are back to a full complement of vines. But uh, if you look at our production, uh, we only made a barrel and a half in 2014 because we really got hurt by the cold. So other than that, it's been a wonderful variety to work with. Uh, people like it. We won a lot of medals with it. It's a great wine. Well, Tom, I've, I've enjoyed uh, visiting with you and seeing your, your space and, and, uh, You've got a, a beautiful location, and we'll talk more about each of your locations uh, when we get a little deeper in, but really looking forward to trying that Malbec. Um, Dick Seibert, Dick Seibert from Knob Hall, welcome. And thanks for having me here today. Um, Knob Hall has been in my family for 200 years, and when we inherited the farm from an aunt and uncle, I was like, what do you do with a farm? and we decided to start growing grapes. So in 2007, we planted our first uh, eight acres of grapes and, uh, and have been uh, growing grapes and making wine ever since. Um, the wine we'll be test tasting today is Prestige. Our first vintage of Prestige was in 2009. It uh, has done a a lot of uh, good things for us over the years. We've won Best in Show. It's been uh, listed on the um, uh, Beverage Institute as uh, 92 points, exceptional wine, and a Best Buy. So it's done very well, and we look forward to uh, tasting it with all of you. Well, Dick, just, just uh, one question. Um, what, When you inherited that farm, what made you come to grapes? <clears throat> we were crazy. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, you know, what do you do with a farm? And um, I literally had the, I, I literally had one of the experts in grains out here, one of uh, Joe's um, uh, colleagues and said, uh, what's the most profitable crop I can grow? And they said, soybeans. And I said, we're growing soybeans. I said, how much am I going to net in an acre? 
And they said, a really good year, $100. I said, forget it. Uh, my wife and I had been to Napa. We had been to France. We had always wanted to, to start a winery. But what that made us do is decide to put more effort and more time in the winery and less in the crops. I like your comment that you were nuts. I, I hear that a lot. From <laughs> you know, a couple of years in, they're like, what was I thinking? But, you know, the, the great news is you're producing phenomenal wine. Um, uh, you know, everybody on this uh, on this chat has has been uh, commended either by reviews or by, uh, you know, top level wine competition wins. So great work to everybody. Um, the newest member of this team, Enrique. Enrique from Casa Carmen. So, so tell us about your operation. Hi, everybody, and thanks for having me as well. Um, as Kevin said, my, my name is Enrique, and um, I am uh, the general director and uh, founder of Casa Carmen Winery. Um, we founded Casa Carmen about four years ago, three and a half, four years ago, with my brother, Felipe. Uh, we are from um, South American family, of Spanish heritage and we grew up kind of obsessed with wine and food and kind of, uh, you know, spent a bunch of time in, in, in Argentina, in Spain, in California, where we started working with, with, um, with the wine industry. And, and then we, we came out here out east actually for, for totally separate reasons. And then when we started discovering the, the wine scene in Maryland, it was very exciting to us to, to realize that we could actually, um, make wine here and that's where we bought um with our with with it with what we had managed to save in our um you know we you know 30 30 or 32 years of life <laughs> we we bought a small farm um and and started started our our label initially kind of custom crushing and and uh buying buying grapes uh from from other local producers and uh we've kind of uh, moved up um uh, little by little to the point where we have right now a very uh, stable kind of long-term partnerships with uh, different growers um, that that grow just great, great, great fruit, and that we we partner together with and work together through the growing season to get the best grapes possible for that year. Um, and last year we were able to build our kind of our own winery, which is the, the Wine Collective. It's a sort of um, it's an urban winery in Baltimore that is sort of a co-op and, and collective of wineries. And Casa Carmen is one of the main one of the one of the member wineries there. Um, and today we will be tasting the Casa Carmen Duende, which is kind of our our um, our highest end red, the, one of one of our proudest uh, productions. So very excited to taste it with everybody. Awesome. And thanks for joining. And I, I took a peek at the wine collective yesterday and my, oh my, is that coming along? And we can't wait to get in there. Uh, I speak for all wine drinkers, all customers to, to get in there and, and have a blast because it's, it's a beautiful spot and uh, can't wait for folks to see it. So with that, um, Joe. Yes. How about, back. We, how about we taste some wines? Driving people crazy. They've been waiting all this time to taste well, these wines. You know, I mean, they, they have to earn it. So uh, it's 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 time to roll. So where would you like to start? Um, I, my uh, opinion would be we start with the Elk Run Cabernet Franc. Um, I'm real excited about the cross-section of wines we have today. This is a great opportunity to see what we're doing across Maryland with uh, dry red wines. We have multiple vintages so we can see how the wines how the each individual the one each year the wines are a little bit different plus also the ageability of these wines uh we have multiple regions we go from the north to west uh, to the south uh, to be able to taste all the regions and how there are so subtle differences with the same variety in different regions but all doing well uh we have straight varietals that we can see what individual varieties do and then of course we have the uh the beauty of the complexity of the blends that we have putting the, the best of all the varieties together to give us kind of a synergistic or a blend to give something that's better than all the individual parts so it's a great uh, group of wines that you chose here and congrats to all the winemakers uh, they're all just showing beautifully i hope uh, everyone is enjoying them so far and and i will just as a programming note we we have one wine uh, that is unrepresented by the winemaking team and that is the uh, bassignani winery piccolo which we'll try uh 
uh, I think, second in the lineup. So first, let's jump to to Neil. Neil. There you are. Now you're off mute. Um, Joe, take it away. Joe and Neil. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm real excited about uh, this wine. Uh, as you know, Cabernet as was mentioned before. Elk Run has been leading the road with Cabernet Franc in, in the state for many years. Uh, I have been promoting this variety. I, overall, Cabernet Franc is the best grape for Maryland and the Mid Atlantic. Consistently makes it through our winters. It's good in the vineyard and makes consistently good wine. Uh, even in off vintages, it shows different complexities but different different characteristics and. Um, Elk Run's done a wonderful job throughout the years to do the best they can in the vineyard to, best, to get the best grapes. But when they have all vintages, it doesn't seem to matter. Their wine still comes through and show the quality of the grapes from that particular vintage, show the complexity. Some are lighter and more fruity, and some are big and complex. So uh, congratulations to them, and I'm looking forward to not only having a good vintage in 16, but also showing a little bit of age on this one and how it uh, develops more complexity. So go ahead, Neil. Well, thank you very much. As I say, uh, Fred and I have been growing Cabernet Franc for quite a while. Uh, it was first planted in 1995 at our new vineyard, uh, and our first harvest was 97. And it turned out uh, that we liked it so much, we decided to bottle it as a sole varietal. Our original plan was just to have a little bit of it uh, and use it as a blender, but uh, it tasted so good, we decided to stick with it. This is the 2016. Uh, this was a little lighter year. Uh, came in at about uh, 21 bricks. Uh, pH was 3.1, and the total acidity was 0.63. All kind of you know mid range for for this area. And uh, we have discovered over the years that uh, growing Cabernet Franc can be kind of a trick because it is it can be very sensitive to what we call the veggies some of those uh, green olive leafy flavors that you can get in cabernet sauvignon and uh, cabernet franc and what we've done is we found out uh, through traveling around and tasting every cabernet franc we could find that if you uh, leaf pull and expose the berries to sun that helps reduce or eliminate the veggies uh, exactly why I don't know, but it seems to work out. Yeah, there is there is science behind that. It shows as soon as you the earliest possible, you pull the leaves and you have less of that compound produced. Therefore, is less there at wine you know, at the production at the time when you're harvesting. So yes, you're absolutely right with that one. So we start pulling leaves as early as possible. We've done our first uh, hedging, and we'll do our first leaf pulling next week. So uh, and that's extremely important for Cab Franc and Cab Soft, but they're related, so it makes a certain amount of sense. One of the things, the questions I want to ask you about this one is um, I've always tell people to, uh, originally people were growing Cabernet Franc and not very happy with it, and I kept saying, stop trying to grow and make Cabernet Sauvignon out of Cabernet Franc. And you guys were one of the first ones that understood that, that you can't grow it the same way as Cabernet Sauvignon, and you can't try to over-extract it and make a big, you know, heavy-duty wine out of it every year. And, and you've been hitting the mark, and this is a classic example of going with what the vintage and the fruit gives you. Yeah, a couple of the things that we discovered is that lower temperature fermentations are better. You do get less extract and color, but you get a lot less of harsh tannins. And that makes uh, the Cab Franc drinkable younger, and it still ages well. Uh, I had a 2007 uh, Cab Franc for my own cellar uh, just a, a month ago, and it was scrumptious. Smooth, delicious, rich, just exactly what I want a Cabernet Franc to be. Uh, so even though we do have lower tannin and lower extract, it's nonetheless long-lived. Absolutely. And that's one of the things I try to teach in my wine appreciation class that most people, when they taste or they look at a red wine, they think the darker the better. And that's not necessarily the case, uh, especially with uh, you know, varietals like Cabernet Franc. You're looking for the extract of the flavors and the, the color is not as critical to get the flavors and the complexity that you're looking for. Some vintages, if you try to do the extra extract, you're just going to get more tannin. And it's not going to be nearly the pleasure to drink. As, and again, great, great uh, example is this one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cab Franc, in this case, this is the 2016, so it's got a little bit of maturity. It was picked uh, October the 6th, and we had finished uh, fermentation and malolactic fermentation by the uh, 
12th of December, 2016, and it went into barrels that mm, January, if I recall correctly. And, and a mix, mix of old and new barrels and stuff correct. like this? Okay. We use about 30% new, and the rest is one, two, and three-year-old barrels. Which, again, perfect for uh, this type of vintage and the, the, the weight of this wine. You don't yes. want to overpower it. That's right. Fred and I want uh, you to taste the wine and say, hmm, I think there's something in there. That might be oak. We don't want you to sniff the wine and say, oak. We want it to be like salt and pepper. You want some on your eggs, but you don't want your eggs to taste like salt. Exactly. So a little bit of spice. It's a nice condiment. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular wine's got a, a lovely nose, kind of spicy, a little piquant. Uh, it's nice acidity. Uh, you know, the 0.63 total acidity is, uh, as I say, right where we wanted to, right where we wanted it to be. Not sure how that happened. Uh, one of the things that uh, Fred does as a winemaker. He does a process called sanier, or bleeding, and that is when you crush the grapes after the harvest, we take a certain amount of the juice out, and that increases the ratio of the remaining juice to skins, so you get more extract of flavor in the solution. And that's one of the ways that we get a slightly more intense version of Cabernet Franc. Um, this wine has got uh, notes of chocolate, ripe olive, spices, uh, and a hint of smoke from the barrel. And it has a very, very long, complex finish. Something I, I miss in a lot of the Virginia Cab Francs I've had. And I don't think uh, that they're growing them properly. I think they're overcropping and not exposing the berries to enough sunlight. Yeah, I think they get a little bit more heat than we do. I think this variety prefers a little bit cooler, time, especially during ripening, um, to to get to the complexities right now. So I hope everyone's getting a chance to taste this and notice all things. What I, you know, what exactly all the things you're saying are right on. Where I really appreciate this wine is you're getting everything you want out of Cabernet Franc. You get the bright dark cherry that you get uh, that you typically want Cabernet Franc. You know, maybe just. If there is a touch of probation, this is adding to the complexity and the spice, but uh, the spice is a real critical part that separates Cabernet Franc from Cabernet Sauvignon. It's not just fruit, fruit, fruit. You're getting a lot of spice in here, and that's really adding to it. But the fun part about this wine is you're starting to get past those primary flavors and aromas, and you're getting starting to get into those aging things where you're getting the complexity and the softness and the... Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, like you would get with a dark and older aged wines, so things are starting to soften, and you're getting the other uh, aged, aged uh, tertiary compounds that are really making this soft enough to drink. Yeah, that's one of the things that adds to the complexity of the finish on this wine. Now, Fred hates me to say this, but it is fabulous with pizza. Pizza wine. Yeah, betcha. Actually, anything with tomato sauce or any grilled meats, we love it. Hey, let let's all agree not to tell Fred, okay? <laughs> don't don't don't, don't tell Fred. Um, yeah, this would go with cheeses. This would go with you know, could go with pizza. This would go with lots of different things. With the uh, complexity and softness and the tannin is just so um, beautifully softened on this. Good job on this, very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, Neil, thank thanks for joining us, and uh, thank. Thank Fred for contributing this wine to the pack. I think uh, folks who got this uh, will be quite excited because it, it's a beautiful wine. And and I'll just give a plug to aging this wine. Uh, I just opened a 2010, and it's beautiful. I mean, it was a great year. It's beautiful, still young, vibrant. Um, so if, if you can stand it, buy two bottles, put one away, and... Uh, with that, Neil, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Yeah, and that nice acidity that Neil talked about will help this wine age uh, longer than most people would expect. So, yes, I agree. So, Joe, uh, up next, let's let's taste through uh, the Bassignani Winery Piccolo. So, I'll hold that up here just so folks can take a look at it. So, this is once I orient myself. This is 2017. It. Uh, piccolo means small in Italian, and uh, this is made by Bert Bassignani at Bassignani Winery up in Sparks, which uh, if I started walking, I could get there in about 10 minutes over the hill. Um, uh, and 
it is a blend of mostly Cabernet Sauvignon and a little bit of Cabernet Franc. And uh, just looking at the notes, it's about 12.5% alcohol and uh, quite a nice wine. So, Joe, I'll let you take the lead on tasting it, but I've got some here. Yeah, and I hope everyone's come, you know, staying along with us with these. I hope uh, everyone has kind of the – hope we got these at the right temperature. Uh, I brought put mine in the wine cellar uh, overnight to get them down into the upper 50s uh, where, where I like my red wines. I opened them up about two, two and a half hours ago to let them start breathing, put a little bit in the glass and some in the bottle, uh, and leave the cork out. And there again, they're all showing beautifully exactly what they should be at this point. So, um, again, this is uh, Piccolo, 2017 Piccolo, a different vintage, a great vintage in Maryland, a very hot uh, vintage. So we had a lot of uh, range of, uh, depending on the, the cropping you had this year, a lot of people, because it was a warm vintage, did uh, some heavy crops and were able to get um, – good complexity in their wines even even with and have most importantly like Bert works has a range from the you know the piccolo through his uh bigger reserve wines that, that he does out of the same same kind of blend which gives you the diversity you're looking for because um with the italians it's all all about wine and food and matching the wines to the food you know this this uh, just very similar to the cabernet franc that we just had in weight matches a lot of uh, you know cheeses and uh, lighter um lighter foods than you would with the uh, the other big red wines that we're going to be uh, moving into in a second. Um, what I like about this wine is, again, we got the, the blend of both the, the Cabernet Franc and the Cabernet Sauvignon. You get a little bit more guts, a little bit more backbone from the Cabernet Sauvignon, but you, he did not overpower the complexity of the, the Cabernet Franc. You still get those subtleties coming through. A little more of the dark fruit, the uh, blackberry and currants that you get from the from the uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon in this one, but you still get that touch of herbaceousness and that, that nice spice from the Cabernet Franc uh, and very, very easy to overpower that uh, with both the blending in the Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, a little bit more oak. So I think he hit that right on the button with this. You get the bright cherries uh, into the darker fruit and uh, starting to get a little bit of the, the tertiary compounds like we have with the Cabernet Franc, a little bit of the aging starting to show, softening on the palate, which uh, is very important. I have a, a, a significant wine cellar, um, you know, 3,000 plus bottles, and I very rarely drink a red wine minimum five years, usually closer to 10 years before we start drinking our red wines. And these two wines show exactly why. Um, in their, if you know, we have tannin or alcohol or anything out of balance, a few years of aging will, um, will definitely help to soften those and make them very easier to drink and definitely better food matching. So highly recommend, as Kevin said, buying multiple bottles of these, drinking one and drinking another one in a couple of years, see how it's going and always have a few left to, to take it to the point where you're getting it to the next level and you can appreciate it a lot more. Uh, Bert's winery is not is a very similar conditions to uh, what we just had in Elk Run. Again, good area for growing Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. Typically, Cabernet Sauvignon can be uh, tannic and a little bit more harsh than this. But again, 2017 vintage, you're able to make a wine like Piccolo where you can put a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon in with the Franc without overpowering it uh, and be able to, to make a very enjoyable, very approachable wine like this uh, where you can get uh, Burt's Lorenzino is you know similar blend, but um, will last much longer and much bigger wines be with the, with the same grapes. And you know uh, we were talking about... Uh, the Sanier, where you're bleeding some of the uh, free run juice away, that was probably done with this Cabernet also to uh, make, uh, and some of the Sanier may have been blended back in that to get the uh, the lighter lighter characteristics of these without the powerful. Yeah, powerful it, it, this is this is one of uh, one of the bargain wines in the state, truly. So you can get this for under twenty dollars, and. Uh, it's consistently a great wine. And uh, like you said, there are some tertiary flavors coming in, getting some, you know, a little bit of leather, some leaves, um, you know, r r really nice wine. And, uh, and I, I like it cause it's walkable. I can yeah. get uh, and we and we need wines like this in the state. It's a it's a challenge. You know, we, we want to drink wines Monday through Friday. We want to have wine with every meal, as far as I'm concerned. And hard to drink, you know, the thirty to forty dollar bottles of wine with with every meal. That's a little bit tough. But having most of the wineries are working on having available inexpensive wines that are very approachable at a certain age, and then still having reserve wines that um, you can put lay down for a few years and make it work. 
Um, Love to hear any comments from anyone in the background, what they're thinking of these. Yeah. So, so Connie's asking, what does walkable mean? It, it, it means it's literally uh, 10 minutes from my house so I could walk there. So join me here and we'll walk over there. And if we're lucky, their pizza oven is, uh, is raring to go. So, um, and if it real interesting quickly, if you take a sip of the Bassignani and then go back and take a quick sip of the Elk Run, you'll see the similarities, but the differences, the Elk Run, again, you'll get all that complexity and the bright spiciness of the Cabernet Franc, but the Bassignani has a little bit of that, but a little bit more of the, the guts, the big, the big uh, fruit and tannin from the uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. So good comparison there to be able to differentiate what each variety gives to you. All right. So with that, uh, I'm going to bring up our, our next panelist to taste. And I, I think I gave him some warning. Dick Seibert from Knob Hall. I'll bring you in here and then I'm going to drop off. Uh, Joe and Dick, have at it. Sure. We were just were talking about the the importance of blending. Again, there there's nice varietals. Uh, the grapes, a lot of grapes in Maryland make varietals as just so with the uh, Cab Franc from Elk Run can be 100% and still be very good. Uh, but as you know, each wine is what I sometimes say. They have, some wines tend to have you know holes. There's some part of your palate that they don't fill out. So that's the beauty of blending, where we can take Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Malbec, and other varieties, even Chambersin in this case, and uh, just completely fill out the palate, add add complexity, add different characteristics, and um, you're going to get a perfect example here in the 2000. 15 prestige from Nav Hall, um, ingenious job of, of blending with this one, getting all of the characteristics together of the individual varieties without anyone actually dominating in, in the blend. So, uh, Dick, you know, talk a little bit about what you and uh, Mary Beth did with this one. Great. Right, well, uh, she deserves all the credit, but I'll. Uh, yeah, I had to throw her, her name because in. Because I'm here, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> we. Uh, we limit uh, the amount of uh, tonnage we grow in our Cab Franc and particularly Chamberson. Chamberson can be overgrown and we, we limit uh, the amount of uh, tonnage per acre. And it obviously produces better grapes. Um, the Cabernet Franc and the Chamberson uh, are then, uh, we do a Seigne on them Often we'll do a, uh, in the past, we've done a Cabernet, uh, a Cabernet Franc uh, Rosé, and we always do a Chamberson Rosé. So that helps, again, to uh, improve the quality of the wine you still have in the tank. Our prestige is primarily Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and uh, then we round it out with Chamberson. Uh, we think that one of the things that has made this uh, so popular is it's just a beautifully balanced wine. Uh, every year, the, the balance on it is great. Uh, the Cabernet Francs and the Merlot, sometimes it's in 20-month uh, uh, in barrel. So we sp it spends a lot of time in old barrels, so it, it's able to uh, mellow out more. And uh, we've had a uh, wine judge in the past say, this is the way wine should taste. So we're real happy with that. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it's just beautiful, melded together, beautiful complexity. Can you talk a little bit about your process of blending with something like this? How you come up with the percentages for such a, a beautifully complex wine where none of the varieties are actually dominating, but they work together? Well, this is one of the fun things. We've worked with John Levenberg, who's our wine consultant. Uh, but uh, what Mary Beth does is, um, you know, we, we will have maybe 20 different uh, uh, potential varieties here of, uh, of wine. So we'll take 5% uh, Chamberson, a 10% Chamberson, a 15% Chamberson. And we're just trying to keep uh, changing the, the numbers until we get the perfect balance. And uh, that's that's what we're really looking for. And is this you consider this your flagship wine? Is this your your which what is out of your grouping? What where does this fit into your? Uh, this format? is one of the most popular. It's not 
it's not our most expensive. We've actually lowered the price to make it more affordable. Kevin was talking and you were talking about having more affordable. So this is now under $30 per bottle, uh, believe it or not. But, um, you know, our, our Cuvée Josephine, which is a Bordeaux blend, is about 38 And our Petit Verdot is about 38 Our uh, Cabernet Franc is a little bit more expensive than this. But um, but we've tried to make this our our flagship in the sense that this is one that's affordable. We have enough of it, and and people know it. It's a steal at that price, if you ask me. Just beautiful, showing all the characteristics we're looking for in the wine. Um, and again, you know, we you can one of the reasons we did this order. If you taste this one and then go back to the Bassignani and then back to the uh, Elk Run Cab Franc, you can kind of just differentiate at the same kind of level of intensity the different differences of the varieties and which ones they're getting in. Each one's getting because we're doing the blending, they're getting a little bit more complex and filling out a little bit more uh, in your palate. Uh, less subtleties from you know with the Cabernet Franc, you got to love the subtleties of the the uh, varietal character that you get but with this one you get less of the subtleties but you get more of a balance on your palate there's not a not a blank spot anywhere across my palate when i taste this wine from the tip <laughs> to the tongue to your roof of your mouth it's really really beautiful coming across well thanks and, and the other thing is it has aged very very well hey dick i, I had a question so we on yeah. a on a prior panel tasting, we, we had someone ask about non-traditional blends, and I, I'd point out that this is a Bordeaux blend, so it's got three Bordeaux grape varieties plus Chamberson, um, right. which is, I think, in most other regions of the country, you wouldn't see. And so right. what 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 does the Chamberson bring? You said it rounds it out, but what what, what can people, how can people taste that Chamberson in here? Well, that's a good question. Uh, a lot of people like Chamberson because a lot of times the tannins are not as, as strong. And, um, you know, I, I particularly like Chamberson. I think it's, I call it uh, Cabernet Sauvignon with fruit because it's got a little bit more fruit and it's a bigger boulder. So it's a little bit, to me, it's a little bit more bold than Merlot. And, uh, and I think that's really what the, uh, what Chamberson brings to it. When we enter this in um, wine judging, uh, the judges, we don't do that, but um, the wine judges come back and say, um, it's, it's like a meritage. Yeah, one of the beauties of this, and I think the Chamberson makes the difference in this, is I use I like to use the word fleshy. It gives you weight on the palate without adding the tannins. Like you said, Chamberson is uh, you get a lot of the bright fruit, a lot of the weight on your palate that you're looking for in red wine without adding that that puckering tannin, the astringency that you can sometimes get if you try to get that kind of weight from the Cabernet Sauvignon, you're going to get much more of the tannin component. So the Chamberson is beautiful when it's added at this level into these kind of wines to fill it out, give you fruit, give you a little bit of the fleshy weight there uh, and not dominate on, on any part of the palate, but just to add the complexity. We have a question here from Leslie Freelo. Do you, is there a secondary fermentation of any kind? Yeah, I believe there is. I would have to ask, uh, talk to Mary Beth about that. <laughs> got to, got to, got to talk, talk to the women in charge. Right. Yeah. right. In general, in general, all red wines um, produced in the state go through a secondary or a malolactic. Yeah, malolactic. Yeah. So we're converting malic acid, which is you know the apple acid, a real strong acid in your mouth, to lactic acid, which is you know the milk acid, which is much more uh, soft and and. Um, kind of lays softly across your, your tongue as opposed to the malic acid, which is real prickly. So yeah, that's why you know we do this to make the red wine softer and easy to uh, easy to approach, but still maintain the acidity we need for ageability and for good complexity on the palate, but without that real um, biting type acidity that would interact with the, the tannins and the astringency and make it more difficult on the palate. So yes, good question. Well, Dick, thanks for joining us and, and hold that label up just so everybody can see it. Okay. Dick, do you make this every year? We make this every year. Okay. And the blend and the blend varies from year to year? The, yes. Um, if the grapes are not quality, we would not make it, but, uh, but we've been lucky to have enough to make every year. 
And uh, yeah, you know, this is the one thing about about all of the wines you're discussing today versus a a box wine or a I should say a um, a bulk wine. If you take if you go to the store and you buy a bulk wine, it's going to taste the same every year. These wines are going to be a little bit different every year. Why? Because grapes are different every year. So that's uh, you know that's one of the neat things about buying from all uh, from vineyards like uh, and wineries like you're discussing today. Because every year it's going to be a little bit different. Absolutely, and that's that's the fun. You just have to keep going back to the wineries every year to taste the new right. varieties and how they're yep. doing and understanding the vintage and what goes behind it. And that helps you appreciate more knowing what wineries deal with on the East Coast to make premium wines like this, where we have many, many, a lot of variation from vintage to vintage and uh, a lot of maladies that come, you know, each year with the rains and the humidity we have to deal with. So it's very a good job, Dick. We appreciate it. It's a struggle, but the reward is high. Dick, thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, Joe, where do you want to head next? Uh, let's go to the Bordelow. All right. Tom Shelton, you are yeah. out. I am out. Okay. Good. So uh, we're switching to a back to a varietal here, uh, Malbec, which is another way. If you're not familiar with it, this is another one of the uh, famous Bordeaux varieties. You have Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot, which are the three main ones that we get in most of the Bordeaux. Malbec and Petit Verdot and uh, to even less uh, Carmenere are the other ones that are sometimes blended in in uh, Bordeaux to make the uh, complex blends that they have that we know, depending on the particular region. And uh, Tom grows all the varieties there, except uh, Cabernet, or he has all the varieties there, so he's able to make individual varietals as well as um, grow making uh, the blends at the same time. So we we decided to put Malbec in. Malbec is difficult to grow in the vineyard, as he said. He's had even in his great site there along the water there, he's had some trouble with some cold hardiness, which is our one of our you know the biggest limiting factor for growing grapes in the in the eastern United States. But uh, he's worked it well. He's got it in a good site, and every vintage he's made has been just a dynamite wine and been been worth worth the effort. Ex, uh, the effort. So, uh, Tom, tell us a little bit about this one. Yeah, let me uh, talk about my approach. It's slightly different than other wineries maybe in the area. Um, my background's in poultry. I worked for Purdue Farms for 23 years, and as you might know, Purdue was a quality fanatic. <laughs> I worked directly for Frank for a long time. So when I got in the business, I wasn't sure I wanted to make wine commercially. And I planted vines in 99, uh, and until 2006, we were not a commercial winery. I was just trying to decide, could we make world-class wines on the Eastern Shore of Maryland? I wasn't sure, but I think we've learned that we can. Um, one approach that I've take, taken, which is a little unique, is that I know that uh, wines vary year to year because of the difference in uh, the environment, the weather, and different factors, disease. And so I do something that's a little unique. One is that with this Malbec, it's a blend of four vintages. I don't put a vintage on my wines. I use lot numbers. This happens to be lot number three. It's a blend of 13, 14, 15, and 16. There were 19 barrels available. I selected 14 of the 19. And typically, I'll add at least one barrel of some other varietal, a Bordeaux varietal. It could be Petit Bordeaux, it could be Cab Merlot. It just depends on what will combine best. Uh, I profile every single barrel. I taste the wine from every barrel. I score the wines, and then I make the selection. This wine went into the uh, was uh, was taken from barrels and moved to stainless in January. I bottled in July. So I spend a lot of time trying to decide what the final blend's going to be. And I worked with this wine for about seven months, oh, almost, well, eight months, trying to decide uh, what the final blend would be. And it's what I call a warm climate Malbec. We're uh, probably 20 feet above sea level. 
Uh, it's very warm. Our growing season is longer. A lot of the Malbacs are coming from Argentina where they, they're at higher elevations, cooler climate. So they're going to be totally different than ours. Uh, the feedback we're getting on this wine is that it's very fruit fruity. Uh, it's different than any other Malbec probably in the case in the wine shops. Um, but it's quite it's quite good. Uh, it was aged in oak 40 over 41 months. That's the other thing we do. We age for an extended period of time. Not many wineries do that. Um, and this is something that we do, and I'm not sure if any of the other wineries are doing it. I suspect there are. Uh, we remove any harsh tannins that might be in the wine since it ages longer by using egg whites, and then we add back tannins that we think will be favorable. The tannin that was added to this wine was extracted from Malbec grapes only. So, um, some of those things might be different, but uh, we think it's a good wine. Uh, we won double gold, gold medals uh, with it. Um, and it's, we think one of the better Malbacs that we've made. So that's my input, but. What was the other part of the uh, uh, plant, remember? Was this uh, Petit Verdot or? I'm not sure, it was probably Petit Verdot, uh, Joe. Yeah, that's what I would think with this. So with this one, again, you get back to a straight varietal character. You get a very, very ripe um, uh, feeling for the for the Malbec. Malbec is an early harvest variety of, of all the Bordeaux varieties. It's the earliest one you harvest, similar to Merlot in harvest time, maybe even a little bit earlier. But I'll, again, we talked about the fleshiness of Cabernet or of uh, Chambersan. Malbec is also like that, just a lot of weight on the palate without all those uh, harsh tannins. Um, with this one, the real ripe fruit is getting past the, you know, the typical cherries that we get of the Bordeaux varieties, getting more towards the black currant and even, even elderberry with this one between the, the blending of the multiple vintages as well as the long-term aging on, on the oak, which will give you more and more concentration of the flavors, but also soften the tannins that you get a little bit from the, uh, the wood. A lot of people say, oh, 41 months in oak, they mu it must tastes like there's wood chips floating in there. But with, with oak, you tend to find the first six months to a year and a half, you get massive amounts of oak extraction and, and you detect it in the wood. But as the wines continue to stay in the barrel or as they uh, uh, tend to evolve in the bottle, the oak gets more integrated. And again, it becomes more of a background of spice. And this one, you can pick up a little bit of the, the smoke and the spice that you get from it, but there's so much flesh and so much fruit from the Malbec that it's it's integrated well. And again, it adds some nice spice and complexity to the, to the wine. Yeah, the only other comment I have is that we had 19 barrels, we selected 14. A couple of the barrels that were not used went into our Meritage. They were the top barrels. Um, and we score every single barrel. So, um, and some uh, were not good enough to make the cut, and they probably went into a, a lesser wine, something like our Wicomico Red, which is uh, bottom, sort of the uh, low end of our wines that we offer. But yeah, when you when you taste this wine, it just lays on your tongue just beautifully and just hangs out there for for a long time you get the nice dark fruit uh just a touch of tannin the, you know the remind you you do still have a red wine the acidity is a nice backbone as you swallow and it stays with you for for a nice long time so very nice and without you know any kind of uh strong alcohol component or anything very nicely done thank you tom what what's the retail price on this uh typically around twenty dollars which you know, I I would recommend a minimum two case buy, because these are these are incredibly drinkable plush wines, and that and that's something that that to me has been the Bordelow style, where um, you know some wineries create wines that are meant for very long term aging and and uh, can be pretty fussy, pretty harsh up front, and need to be opened and aerated uh, or or aged for a number of years before opening it you can pop a bottle of Bordelot and you're getting a world-class wine, a big fleshy plush wine 
um, without that fussiness of needing to age it. And uh, we really appreciate that because that that yeah. that needed. We're doing a lot of that aging in the barrel. Yeah. yeah, he's doing all the aging for us. We don't have to put this in our well, cellar. He's doing it, it for us. That's yeah, great. Our, our Shamerson that we just released was aged an average of 60 months. Uh, we're getting ready to do a new cab. Uh, I'm sorry, not cab. Uh, something Meritage. else we did. Uh, yes, the Meritage was 48 months. Wow. So we we don't release a red unless it's been aged a considerable amount of time. Well, thank uh, you. That 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 I saves guess. that saves on the seller space. So I appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. And we've heard the term crazy a few times, and we've all <laughs> all the wines we've had so far shows a little bit of craziness of all these yeah. uh, winemakers, what they do to deal with these grapes in the vineyard. Um, but most importantly, they all they're all striving to do what what's best for them. The, you know, the Elk Run just shows you know the beauty of Cabernet Franc in their vineyard, the uh, Bassignani, the great blend, the uh, Elk, uh, the uh, Knob Hall, and how they how they can get the complexity out of all these varieties in, in a very challenging environment and in, uh, in Clear Spring. Uh, they, again, as crazy as they were to plant varieties there, they listen closely to what we recommended and where each variety could go. That maximize the quality and the cold hardiness and, and it, it um works. it's it's working and it, and it's it's real reassuring and allows me to sleep better at night when we talk to these wineries knowing that uh not only are they surviving and doing well but they're, they're just making premium quality wines from vintage to vintage and uh from varietals to blends it just these and, and you know seeing less than 20 dollars this is just you know another excuse for crazy <laughs> it's pretty incredible well, tom thank you very much for joining us yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, Joe, we're going to hop to the last wine of this tasting. Oh, I hate that. that. We really have to end. Well, Jeez. no, we don't have to end, but we got. We was the last one. one? Okay. So, uh, Enrique, I'm going to bring you up. Um, Enrique Piaris from Carmen Wines. Thanks again for being here. Of course, thank you, thank you, and thank you again for putting this together. This is great, and. Thanks to everybody else that has, you know, that has participated. Just really wonderful stuff. And kind of what I, what I said at the very beginning is one of the things that that um, excited us and propelled us being being uh, being you know not from Maryland uh, to to open a winery and, and and here was to see that people were doing things well, um, that the that the industry was young, but that there's already enough people working hard to make excellent wine. So. You know that is that is very exciting. Um, so let me, yeah, let me let me talk a little bit about about this about this particular wine. Um, yeah, if you give us an idea of where you are, um, with the grape, the conditions you're growing, because you're in a unique environment also compared to the other people we've been talking we, with. We'd like we to are, know a little bit about and, that. And 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 Joe, let me. So something about kind of our portfolio in general. We make three uh, basic wines. These are our our white, our rosé, and our red. And we focus on kind of traditional Vitis vinifera uh, varietals, local grapes. Um, this one that we're going to taste today has some nuances and particularities. It's a, it's a particular project that I want to talk about. So, so let, let me let me kind of first explain that, that the three basic ones that we the three wines that we make uh, we make with this idea of being uh, just really old world style wines in the sense that old world style wines are part of a culture and meant to be meant to be part of the of the dinner table um these now there's something uh, interesting that you will notice in this wine and look at you know if you look at the year um it's a 2018 uh and and, and what do we know about that year um as as in the wine industry here on the on the east coast um very forgettable. <laughs> you typically, I try not to mention that vintage to most wineries when I talk That's with right. them. That's right. And That's so, part of the craziness so we keep talking about and growing grapes on the East Coast. The worst vintage in my 30 years, to summarize that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And But for us, it was a very interesting year. And I'll tell you the reason that we, um, we are sort of, uh, in some ways, we are a little bit different than many others, which is because we're, we're we're somewhat punk in some ways, right? We're we're young and we and we and we, and we like to do things um, slightly differently, and and this is a perfect example of that because um, we kind of identify ourselves with the garagist tradition in some ways, which is a, for those of you who don't know, it was a 
It was a movement that emerged in, in France in the, starting in the 80s uh, of winemakers that were um, making wines in their garage, right? And that were kind of fighting against the Bordeaux traditions and saying, you know what, we're, we're going to kind of, we're not going to be as terroir focused. We're going to kind of do our own, our own thing. Right. And, and, and what we do is a little bit similar in the, in the sense that like we, we have a small kind of home vineyard, but a, a lot of the grapes that we, that we use are from, from other local vineyards that we work with, but that we, you know, kind of go around and see which grapes we, we, we really, we really love. Um, and these, these, in 2018, uh, we have gotten all of our Cabernet Franc, which is for our Tinto, uh, that we release every year. But then, you know, the fall rains uh, started, as, as, you, as you remember. And fall rains started in uh, July that year, so <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. And so, and so we, we started seeing what was happening in the vineyard, and we said, you know, this is a really good time to do that project that we've talked about for so long, uh, which is the Duende. And, and what is special about it, it is that it is a quintessentially garagiste project because it is our way, the, the, the hopes of this wine are very lofty, which is that it is our way of creating what we think can be the, 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 the best American red, uh, the best that, that, that the American kind of continent can offer in the sense that it is 50% local grapes uh, from the East Coast and 50% West Coast grapes. Um, and we, and we, you know, obviously 2018 was a perfect year to do that, uh, given the year that we were, that was shaping up to be here. So in this wine, you have 37% Merlot, which is all local of the Cabernet Sauvignon. A portion is 34% and a portion of that is local. And then the Petit Bordeaux, 29% is from California. Um, but the important thing with it is that what we try to show with it is that is that the, the whole is more than the sum of its parts in some ways and that what we you know my brother and i spend a lot of time in california and what we didn't like about the wines over there is what we liked about the wines over here and then and the, but then we missed a little bit of that as well and that's what we try to bring into this wine so when you give it when you, you give it this wine a swirl and you know you'll feel it in the palate it's it has it has the, it has it is very weighty and it is um and it is uh it has all of those that very dark cherry dark fruit uh notes on the nose and while not never losing that balance that is so uh that is such a mark of good east coast reds uh that is such a that that beautiful acidity that just kind of carries you through and that makes a wine drinkable yeah from just the, the tasting i've been doing over the last hour or so everything you're mentioning is coming through you get the you know the the bright dark fruit aromas that you're looking for. It tends to be, you know, a little bit more on the fruity ends than the complex ends at first with the, uh, the bright fruit. But just as it, when you put it in your mouth, the, the softness um, of the old world style comes through at the end with the finish. Uh, it's bright fruit, a little you know, touch of, I call it sweet fruit up front, real bright fruitiness and on the front palate, but then dries, as you said, with that nice crisp acidity from the old world style that you uh, have a, a good combination here. It's working very, very well on the palate. The alcohol is tame. It's a little bit higher alcohol probably than the other wines we've had here, but again, not out of balance that it wouldn't go very, very well with uh, food for sure. So great combination of, uh, yeah. of yeah. characters. Yeah, I mean, here. I mean, we spend about 15 months in French oak, um, about a 60, 40, regime 60% new, 40%, um, I'm sorry, 60% used, 40% new um, oak. And then we have about, um, about, about, about 50 cases of these still in oak that will stay there for another year or so. Can you talk a little bit about the blending since you had such a diverse group of grapes to work with, a diverse, diverse, uh, diverse group of yeah. wine? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, um, uh, you know the, the the Merlot and the Cabernet Sauvignon are um, were well, pretty e easy because those were the the kind of the wines the the, the grapes that we use every year from from uh, the from a particular local vineyard that we work with um, and and so those were kind of a no brainer that they were going to be there as kind of the the, the the backbone and that East Coast characteristic um, and then in the with the with the with the Petit Verdot I think is what brings such an interesting characteristic especially. A West Coast Petit Verdot. This one, this particular one, is from a 
um, you know, an area close to the Sierra Mountains in the Molokume, uh, the banks of the Molokume River. Um, and, and so it is, it is obviously a very different terroir and it brings in that like higher alcohol, higher fruit that would totally be honestly a punch in the face. Was it not, <laughs> if, if not for the, if not for the, for the for that blending of the, of the Merlot and the, and the Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and that's kind of what we like about it, right? That it's, that it really, I think expresses both of those terroirs together, uh, without, without sacrificing anything. Um, which is also why we named it, the, what we named it, uh, we named it Duende, which is, um, which in the Spanish culture, uh, is explicitly in, re in reference to art, uh, means master of the house. Um, or, and it basically refers to that spirit of inspiration in the artist that, uh, that directs his, his dwelling place towards creating something, something remarkable. Um, and, and this wine has, has more focus on the, on the craft itself uh, than on the vineyard, perhaps. And that's why it seemed to us uh, perfect to, to, to name it after, after, um, after this spirit of artistic inspiration. Yeah, and especially in a vintage like 18, that was such, such a challenge for, for Eastern viticulturists to be able to uh, find the white wine, the right wines from the other areas of the country that would blend well with this without dominating it, but still keep the characteristics you're looking for. And they said a very, a very appropriate name. It was, I, I love reading the background of this on, on the website. Most Everyone needs to go back and read about this and see that after tasting it and hearing the story, it's a very appropriate name for it. And I, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another interesting thing is, again, we've been going trying to get to go back and forth. They appreciate the varietal character. We went from the Knob Hall back to the Bastianani, back to the Elk Run to differentiate. It'll be fun to go back and forth with this one and the um, Bordelow. The Bordelow is, again, 100% East Coast, but it's still because of the the ripeness and the, and the number of years in oak, you get that real fleshy, dark um, ripe fruit that's you know more New World style there with the bright fruit. So to be able to compare these back and forth, it's again a real nice comparison of the complexities that we can get and just the intensities of individual varieties, varietals or the what the blend can bring to filling out the palate. With that, Enrique, I wanted to thank you for joining and for contributing this wine to the wine pack. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's so cool. And, and, and seriously, best of luck to you and John and the rest of the team getting that winery open to the public. I know you've been making wine uh, for the last couple of months and uh, had quite the harrowing experience building out that winery with days to go until the grapes came in and, and you managed to do it. So, um, well, opening, opening is uh, July 10th. We'll definitely be open after that. Wonderful. So um, come, come, see us, come see us and bring a mask. And, and bring a mask. Yes, certainly, certainly, certainly. Um, so again, thanks, thanks for joining us. And uh, Joe, um, give us a, a review. What do you think of the wines we tried? Well, as as I said when I first started, this was a real exciting opportunity to to taste a great cross section of wines, individual varietals, uh, over multiple vintages, uh, even multiple locations around the state, and uh, adding a, a touch from California. The blends, the single varietals, the multiple vintages, it's a lot of things going on, and it just shows, again, how well we've gone, uh, uh, how well we've grown in Maryland in making red wines. Red wines are a huge challenge, uh, growing them in the vineyard and then making soft, complex wines that are approachable and uh, approachable young. The great proportion of wines that we that we make in the state are drunk within the first year or two. But also, as we're showing here with the 16s and the 15s and 17s, that you can put lay these wines down a few years and they, they get nothing but better. They get I mean, more complexity, more softness. And um, whether you're drinking them early and enjoying them or uh, laying them down and enjoying them later, they're they're lots of potential and no matter where you go in the state you're going to find high quality good quality uh, red wines that can drink quickly or have good ageability whether you like blends or whether you like uh, the individual varieties you're going to find what you like uh, in many many places in maryland and again they um, a strong strong uh, kudos for all the wineries here that we've had today and all the ones around the state because it's uh, to make quality wines like this year in and year out in Maryland is a, is a, is a huge challenge. Um, I've heard wineries saying, you know, we give kudos to California. What can they, they can do, but they have very consistent conditions yeah. throughout the summer. They, no, they don't the have to deal with humidity. They don't have rain uh, and they do a great job, but 
we have to do everything right every year to get the quality wines uh, in the, the quality grapes in the vineyard and then make sure in the vin- in the winery we're doing the best job at extracting from that and um We've had a great example today of the intensity in the vineyard that people are using to get this quality and then intensity in the winery for 41 months in oak, uh, the blending. People are really, really committed to doing this and uh, a lot of uh, good controlled craziness out there to come up with these wonderful wines, both uh, what they do in the vineyard and in the winery. And congratulations to all the people involved here. Uh, a true blessing for me to, to taste all these and to taste through and uh, to hear, hear the background. Yeah, and I, I I wanted to thank you, Joe, very much for for leading us through the tasting, and and Tom, and Enrique, and Neil, and Dick, who had to jump off. Thank you all for, for contributing your wines to the wine packs and for being on. Kevin, can you give us a quick update? What's happening in the industry as far as opening up and what uh, you know ideas for go, going to wineries and tastings, potential festivals? Sure. Sure. Yeah. M- many many wineries are are back open and uh, are serving outdoors while the weather's great and indoors at a limited capacity but in general the wineries are open outdoors still um we with regards to events we're still waiting to see how late summer and fall will play out uh with outdoor events and what they're going to look like if and when we have them so stay tuned to marylandwine.com to uh to get latest details on that and uh We've got a great comment there from Connie. Thank you, Connie. And see, you earned it, right? So um, with that, just, hey, thanks. Uh, I want to actually thank you, Kevin, for your effort in pulling this together and getting the wines from all the wineries and then delivering to the various speakers and the people and all the many people who who have been on the the show today to taste things out there in in the audience. We appreciate them being there, but we really appreciate your effort in making this possible. And they're very unusual circumstances but to be able to taste five premium wines in the in the comfort of our our own kitchens and and rooms is just a, a true pleasure and advantage for us we appreciate your effort in making it happen this 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 was truly uh, in every sense of the way a team effort so thank thanks to our team at, at maryland wineries and grow and fortify and and with that uh we are going to sign off and thanks all to the panelists and joe thank, thank you very you. much everyone stay safe out there everyone needs to stay safe and grab a nice bottle of Maryland wine. And I will simply close out by saying thanks everybody for joining. And you can uh, always learn more about what's going on with Maryland wine at MarylandWine.com. And we've got a couple more of these tastings. We've got rosé and sweet wine and dry red and weird and wild, uh, which is definitely worth tuning into. So with that, uh, thank you everybody for joining And Skip, thank you for hanging on there with us. And Abby, thank you for helping to arrange all of this. And John, thank you very much. And with that, cheers, everybody.